So it was 2001. I was working at a university in America, and we were researching robots that could climb down into rubble and search for people after hurricanes and earthquakes. I got a call early one morning, and the person on the other end of the phone said, gather up all the equipment in the team. We need you guys to drive north. There's been an attack on the Trade Center. 24 hours later, I was standing in front of an unimaginable disaster scene. It turns out that most of the robots that we took with us stayed on the truck. The robots that we thought were gonna be the most useful were too large. It actually turned out to be these smaller wired robots that had mostly been neglected that ended up providing the most value to our search. So that's what we used for the next 11 days to search for people. That event was life-changing for me because I learned that you can plan as much as you like, but there is no replacement for actually going there. There's a kind of a wonderful humility to having studied something for so many years so deeply, and then just have the universe show you something and demonstrate that you kind of got it wrong. I've been seeking out those kinds of feelings and epiphanies ever since. And so fast forward 15 years later in my career, and I was the head of a robotics group in California for NASA. I loved building robots for space and teaching them to go to places that I couldn't go. Today, I'm one of many who's helping to build Australia's first lunar rover. Now, I've worked with a lot of brilliant people that have studied the moon for most of their career, and I can tell you for sure that the moon is way more extreme than you think. You see, Hollywood has kind of done us a disservice by making access to space and the moon look almost pedestrian. You see, your experience, from an evolutionary standpoint, is based on about six million years of cleverly avoiding predators and foraging for food. That experience serves you poorly on the moon. Your intuition, it's only going to get you part of the way, and in many cases, it will be dead wrong. Now, when I talk about wheeled things on the moon, you probably think about the Apollo moon buggies. These were amazing pieces of equipment, <laughs> even by today's standards. But despite their appearances, it's almost comical to think of how different these are from the vehicle that brought you here tonight. So, in the interest of a little bit of fun and whimsy, let's do a thought experiment. Let's imagine that I have the ability to transport your car magically to the surface of the moon. I'll do it while you're driving home. We consider this like the kickoff of a lunar road trip in which you can visit all of the well-preserved historical monuments on the moon. <laughs> we'll, we'll probably piss off a lot of scientists in the process too, but it'll be fun. I will be gracious enough to give you and all of your passengers spacesuits mostly to keep you alive, but also so you can kind of sit back and enjoy watching the physics play out in front of you. You're going to be safe and sound. Your car, maybe not so much. So are we all ready? Okay, the first thing that happens is your engine's going to stop. <laughs> on the moon, there's no air, and if your car runs on petrol, uh, it requires oxygen for combustion, and so the engine immediately is going to stall. How do we solve this for rovers? Well, of course, we run everything on electricity. So most rovers have solar panels. Some really cool robots use this thing called a radioisotope thermal generator, or an RTG. Now, the idea here is you take a little bit of radioactive material, you capture the heat that's coming off of it, and then you turn that into electricity, and then you store it away. Imagine not having to pay for petrol for 15 years. And that's what an RTG gets you. I want one. <laughs> but let's, let's not talk about power for a second, because uh, you've actually got much bigger things that you need to deal with. The moon is in vacuum, and when I teleported your car there, it had air in it. So the cabin of your car now has rapidly decompressed. Uh, it probably took your windshield with it. 
And so now that you're proudly in your spacesuits, sitting in your windshieldless car, you probably haven't also noticed that your tires are dramatically overinflated. They've possibly <laughs> even popped. And you may go, oh, oh, hang on, hang on, Mark, I know this one. Um, on your rovers, you use metal tires. And you would be correct. Um, but interestingly, air-filled rubber tires have been used on the moon. So during Apollo 14, the astronauts had a little cart that they used to haul around all of their equipment. And Goodyear manufactured rubber tires that were installed on this thing. Now, they had a lot of problems with it. <laughs> if they parked it in the wrong orientation where one of the tires was in shadow, then the tire would get so dramatically cold uh, that it would pretty much go outside of its design spec. And so metal tires became the norm by Apollo 15. There's other problems with air on the moon. So did you know that with electronic devices, when they're manufactured, sometimes air can get trapped in the components or the circuit board. And when you take that circuit board then to space, that air, like your windshield demonstrated to you, wants to rapidly expand and it will surely damage the circuitry. So while you're sitting in your car, all of your dashboards and entertainment systems and pretty much any other circuit board in the car is probably damaged beyond repair at this point. It's definitely gonna void your lunar warranty. There's not gonna be an electronics store nearby for you to repair it. Your radiator, uh, the cooling system of your car requires air to pass over it. And that's not happening right now. So even if your car is, your engine is still running, it's likely to overheat and will probably soon seize up. But, all right, let's use this as an opportunity to talk about temperature. So if I were kind enough to transport you to the sunny side of the moon, you're now facing 130 degrees Celsius, or 266 degrees Fahrenheit. You see, there's this flaming ball, the center of our solar system, and right now you have no atmosphere protecting you from it. The plastic and rubber on your car is likely starting to melt. And unfortunately, that heat is going to stay with you. You see, in vacuum, there is no convection. Heat doesn't rise. It just radiates. And so for 14 days, you are going to be bombarded with both heat and light. Now, it turns out that heat sometimes acts a lot like light. So if you've ever seen a spacecraft and it looks like it's wrapped in kind of this weird reflective foil, the idea is if you can take those photons and turn them around the other way, then that'll help you stay a lot cooler. Now, if I was evil enough to send you to a lunar sunset, then very soon you will be experiencing negative 170 degrees Celsius, or negative 275 degrees Fahrenheit. All of that rubber and plastic, it's getting really hard and brittle like ice. Now the way that we solve this for robots uh, is we put little electric heaters in there. Keep them warm, the batteries, motors, and other important bits that we need to keep warm. Some really cool robots use a little bit of radioactive material that they put in a capsule. It's about the size of a C-cell battery. And what you do is you stick this strategically inside of the robot to help keep it warm during the night. So let's assume that your engine's still running, you haven't melted, and you haven't frozen yet. Well, the next thing that might happen is the computer that controls your engine might start having some problems. So out in the universe, there's these cosmic rays and uh, solar particles that are shooting around. You can think of these kind of like little ion bullets that are flying through things. And if they pass through a computer, they can sometimes flip a bit from a zero to a one or a one to a zero, called a bit flip. So imagine a computer doing a simple arithmetic. Let's say it's subtracting one from a number. It might go nine, eight, seven, bzz, three, two, one. You can see why this would be a problem. Now the way that we solve this problem is we use much, much older processors. Inside of them, those older processors have bigger transistors. So it turns out the bigger the transistor is, the more resistant it is to these bit flips. 
If you ever used a Macintosh back in the late 90s or 2000s, you likely used a, basically the similar processor to what we use in some of our most advanced satellites and rovers that we fly today. Another way of solving this problem is to use multiple computers. So the idea here is you have the computers do their calculation together, they compare their answers, and if anybody disagrees, then you have the option to throw out the calculation and try it again. The space shuttle did this. It had four computers for its flight system, and they would all vote on the answer. And there was a fifth one that was standing by to break ties. It was like a little computing democracy for every decision that needed to be made. All right, so let's go back and check the scoreboard again. So let's imagine that your engine's still running, you haven't melted, you haven't frozen to death, and your computer's still running. Well, I got more bad news for you. The lunar dirt, regolith as the scientists like to call it, it is wrecking every bit of mechanical parts on your car. You see, the regolith is very sharp and hard. Unlike on Earth, it hasn't benefited from the weathering and movement and other things that you're familiar with. Imagine like dust or flour. But now imagine it having the consistency of the grittiest sandpaper you've ever felt. And now, imagine that it wants to stick to everything. You see, when you're in a lower gravity environment, in vacuum, static electricity becomes one of your primary forces. And so this regolith is going to get all over you. And the only way you're going to be able to get it off is to brush it off because there's no air. Have you ever rubbed a balloon on your clothing and then held it and watched your hair come out and be attracted to it? Uh, obviously, I can't do this experiment here tonight, but I'll leave it as a homework to everybody back home. Well, that's basically the same effect that we're talking about. You, now, you might say, hang on, Mark, my car is plenty dirty. This is really not one of the things that I'm going to be concerned about. And uh, I would actually say, well, hang on a second, because there's one other thing that the regolith is going to cause for you. So even though the moon looks very white and bright to our eyes, the regolith is actually dark gray, it's almost black. And most importantly, it absorbs heat. So remember that thing I said earlier where we're gonna to try to reflect the photons away? Well, if you get stuck in this stuff, it's not only gonna absorb heat, but it's also gonna act as an insulator. Now the best analogy I can make is this would be like wearing a black wool sweater in direct sunlight on the hottest day that you can imagine. Sounds like a real miserable way to go. Believe it or not, this is exactly what killed one of the most successful Soviet moon rovers that's ever flown. The Apollo astronauts, they drove their moon buggies around. Today's rovers, they're a lot more like little autonomous cars where we tell them where we want them to go and they go in that direction and they try to cleverly avoid the rocks. So let's imagine for a second that now you're that little computer with your little cameras and you're gonna drive around. Did you bring your sunglasses with you? I certainly hope so, because it, if you're driving toward the sun, it is going to be oppressively bright and I guarantee you're gonna be overwhelmed very quickly. If you should decide to retreat to shadow or a crater or something like that, this is some of the darkest and coldest black in the solar system. To give you an example, there are craters on the South Pole that have not seen light in billions of years. This wreaks havoc on our cameras and algorithms that we use for navigating. Now, it's important to know that robots on the moon, it's not just an experiment. If we are going to have a sustained presence there, they're gonna be needed. We're gonna to have to have robots there before, during, and after the humans arrive. And the good news is, we're working really hard to make this happen. Now, the nations of the world have sent 137 missions to the moon. 74 of them have succeeded, 63 of them have failed. That means that the world's best engineers, likely working harder than any other time in their careers, have a slightly better than a coin flip chance of succeeding. But even those failures help us learn and help us reach beyond what our eyes, ears, and other senses can teach us. Of the things that I talked about tonight, only two, maybe three of those things can be simulated here on Earth. 
And that is delicious and wonderfully frustrating to people like me that know that the only way that you're going to learn these lessons is to go there. Thank you. Thank you.